Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Adam Ferguson. I think many of you know of Adam and his work. Um, he's currently director of the Data Science Brain and Spinal Cord Injury Center, BASICS, the cool, cool uh, name, associate professor of Department of Neurological Surgery at the Zuckerberg uh, San Francisco General Hospital and principal investigator San Francisco VA Health, Health uh, Science as well. A little bit about uh, his background. He uh, received his uh, PhD in psychology at Texas A&M. I didn't know about, I didn't know about that, uh, Adam. Ohio State postdoc, uh, University of California, San Francisco postdoc, assistant professor in 2010 at uh, UCSF. And he's currently associate professor, as I said, director of data science, brain and spinal cord center. So when you think about um, Adam's interest in research, one obviously targets the pathophysiology and treatment of brain and spinal cord injury, some of the things that all of us are interested in every day. Uh, looking at um, statistical modeling and this holistic, holistic approach to looking at data, that's what's really interesting and in what uh, he's, uh, he's um, uh, here today to talk about, this convergence of information. And even when we're thinking about rats or you're thinking about people, there's a lot of outcome measures uh, in terms of the injury and what the therapeutic interventions, we're finding more and more that these data sets are extremely, extremely complicated. And as the data gets larger and larger, you need new programming approaches and things like that. So, so uh, data science is a big uh, push for um, Adam's uh, research uh, activities. Um, leveraging data science for discovery in, in, uh, in chronic TBI, community-based repositories, um, you know, uh, Adam will talk, talk about how important it is for us to, to provide data to these platforms so that they can be used by other, other groups, things like that, the open data commons for SCI and TBI as an example as well. So data dissemination and sharing is really another uh, area that uh, Adam's interested in. So today, um, Adam's going to be talking about FAIR, F-A-I-R, data sharing and advanced analytics for translational neurotrauma. I'd like to thank um, Adam for giving this lecture and also for uh, agreeing to be uh, the external reviewer for um, Helen and my uh, graduate student, uh, Hannah Radebach, who will be dis uh, defending her dissertation in neuroscience at two o'clock. So please, anyone that's interested in the subject, please come back at two o'clock and Hannah will be providing, a, I think, a very uh, interesting um, large data machine learning approach in terms of the, um, the preclinical TBI data that we had. So da uh, Adam, thank you very much uh, for being here today. Really appreciate it and looking forward to your lecture. Thanks everyone. It's, it's great to see so many familiar faces. Um, I've, uh, I haven't visited Miami in, I guess, a couple of years. So some of this may be review and I'm gonna try to supplement it with um, some new material. So the title of my talk is Fair Data Sharing and Advanced Analytics for Neurotrauma. I'll define this concept of fair data. Um, I have a few disclosures, mostly uh, it's federal and nonprofit grants, but I also do a little bit of uh, nonprofit consulting for data science and biostatistics. Are you guys able to see my um, mouse? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay, good. Uh, and um, I also serve on a scientific advisory board, and I have in-kind support for data analytics through this company, Data Robot. I will not be talking about any of these commercial things today. So the premise of my talk today is fundamentally that CNS injury is complex. That's basically the main take-home message. Um, you know, if you consider the human brain has uh, over one trillion synapses. And then you superimpose on this a bunch of heterogeneous injuries of all different types. And uh, yet, despite this complexity, uh, we've resigned ourselves to classifying traumatic brain injury as mild, moderate, or severe. So what I'm gonna be claiming today is that this simple stratification is insufficient to capture the complexity of the injured CNS. Um, so to sort of drive this point home, this is the, they called this the slide that went around the world. Um, this is from Elisa Jean and Jeff Manley, and it shows six different examples of severe traumatic brain injury in humans. You see that there's epidural hematomas, contusions, diffuse axonal injury, subdural hematomas, subarachnoid hemorrhage, intraventricular hemorrhage, diffuse swelling, all these different pathologies that may represent distinct therapeutic targets. Yet, Clinically, they're classed as one thing, 
severe TBI. Uh, we have a similar problem in spinal cord injury. You know, the human spinal cord has over a billion synapses that do their own processing. The spinal cord can do learning and memory um, in some sort of primitive ways. And uh, despite the fact that we have heterogeneous injuries that are superimposed on this complexity, we resign ourselves to this very simple five point Asia grading system, you know, Asia A through E. And again, I think this is insufficient to capture the complexity of the injured nervous system. So uh, to drive this point home, this is a, an image I got from Jason Talbot, who's a neuroradiologist in our team. And it shows all the different ways that clinical radiologists could score spinal cord injury. And there's very little consensus about the way to do this. So, um, and then, you know, not to leave the animal preclinical folks out of this, um, when you get into the preclinical literature, we have gazillions of tiny measures of biofunction. Um, and I'm, I, I should say, I, I'm picking on myself here because I do have a wet lab and all of these panels are from my own papers. But I will say that the literature is littered with these types of multi-panel figures where, you know, you have the same animal and you measure them on a bunch of different measures and then you have a bunch of histopathology and you have an entire paper that's just panel after panel after panel of these univariate looks at the data. And what I'm gonna be arguing today is that we need to take a more holistic approach as Dalton said in the introduction to try to pull all this data together, put it into a modern data system so that you can then operate on the data using advanced analytics, things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, of course, the main governor of this, the main problem is this poor soul that has to do the data entry and curation, right? Um, we don't yet have fully automated systems to collect data in preclinical or clinical neurotrauma. And so we do have a real problem with trying to ready the data for uh, ingest into advanced data systems. So this whole kind of concept that we should be taking all our data together kind of recasts neurotrauma, not as a biology problem or a clinical problem, but rather as a big data problem. So I live in the San Francisco Bay Area and you know, big data is on billboards next to the airport. So I wanna take a moment to sort of define the term. So it turns out the history of this term big data um, came from IT consulting in you know, the first part of the, the uh, 21st century. This company Gardner Consulting basically said modern data systems um, are insufficient to handle the coming problem of big data. That is the problem of the three Vs, the problem of data volume, data velocity. So this could be small bits of data that are moving quickly, like the Twitterverse, for example. And then the problem of data variety, which is to say data that is not particularly big or high moving, but has a wide variety of different uh, features. And I would argue that CNS injury is a very specific type of big data problem that falls in the variety category. So I think when we say big data in the context of neurotrauma, we need to consider that it's not like you know, large volumes or high speed, it's just this problem of variety on a very large scale. So, um, and I should note that this isn't unique to neurotrauma, but instead I think it's endemic in biomedicine as a whole. If you look at the way um, the biomedical literature uh, reports data, if you plot data size against the number of data sets, you see that there's relatively little organized big data. Some things like the Human Genome Project or transcriptomics are relatively organized, but most of the data that's in the literature is this modestly sized long tail data. So there's a high variety, wildly heterogeneous data sets that are reported in the literature. And then at a certain point, you reach the literature limit. And beyond this, you have um, the long tail of unpublished or dark data. There's some interesting features that we now know about dark data in biomedicine from meta-analysis. The first is that this comprises about 85% of the data that's collected in biomedical research. And this is, uh, this is stuff from um, Malcolm McLeod that was published in 2014. And so, what this really suggests, of course, is that 
we have an economic problem with biomedical research because if 85% of our budget uh, results in data that is never disseminated in any form, then you could actually come up with this shocking statistic that about $200 billion a year in 2014 dollars of our research effort goes straight into a file cabinet and is never disseminated in any form. And um, so that's problematic when we go to Congress and like argue we need more money. It's also problematic in terms of science and scientific findings because it suggests that the literature only comprises 15% of the data. And so then you could ask yourself, is there something special about the 15% of the data that we happen to publish? And um, it's been demonstrated that there is something special. It's that data that conforms to you, the investigators, pre-existing bias. We have a term for bias in science, we call it a hypothesis, but it is truly a bias. You're saying, I am going to reject these data if they do not conform to my pre-existing notions about how they should look. And so hypotheses actually create this endemic bias in the published literature. So there are some statisticians who have argued that this means that the published research literature is by and large false, meaning it reports improbable, very difficult to replicate results that are um, only those things that have been highly selected by the investigators because they could write about it. So this is all very negative and kind of mean, I would say. <laughs> and I should, I should say a caveat here is I now have like 150 papers myself. So I am we, we are all complicit in this system, right? Um, so, it's not really anyone's fault that we are highly selective in our publications. It's just sort of the nature of science, right? Uh, you know, the, the students in this group know that what you do as a scientist is you spend enormous effort building these airtight methods and protocols. And then you collect reams of really great data and then some maybe not so great pilot data. And then this generates hundreds to thousands of pages that you then magically winnow down into your high impact nature paper, hopefully, right? And through that process, there's increasing information loss and potential for selective reporting. So in other words, in biomedical science, we do have a data dissemination technology. It just happens to be this 17th century technology that's based on the advent of the printing press. It's the scientific paper. And this is actually the first scientific paper that was published in English in 1665. Um, and it was a narrative where authors said, I had this great idea. I went and collected data and here's what I found. And by and large, this hasn't changed for 400 years. We still do this. This is what the scientific literature is about. It's about building a narrative. So it's perhaps not appropriate for disseminating data on the scale that we need for modern analytics. So, I'm going to argue for the rest of this talk that now we just need something beyond the published literature to disseminate our data. So we need a 21st century solution to this. And um, as Dalton mentioned, I, I became a faculty in 2010, um, basically when I got this grant <laughs> to try to build a, a multi-center spinal cord injury database um, that was also multi-species. So the idea here is we want to go get all the raw source data that's sitting in the file cabinets and put it into an actionable modern data system. And so um, we were funded to do this and actually had some success. Um, in this grant, we were able to pull together about 60 million data points from over 4,000 individuals with spinal cord injury. Now these were rats and mice and a small number of de-identified human data. Um, so this was 13 centers and it was the basis of this thing that uh, in the end was called the Vision SCI repository. So uh, what this illustrated to people was that our field, spinal cord injury, was willing to share data. I mean, people were very willing to give us the data, especially if they didn't have to deal with it, if we were the ones who tried to, to, to manage the data. So this has now been expanded um, and picked up as a multi-funder initiative uh, under a new PI, not me. I'm a co-PI on this project now. Um, it's led by Kareem Fouad, and it's to develop this open data commons for spinal cord injury, which has a website. You guys can all go there. You can sign up. You can set up a lab, and you can even upload your data if you want. 
Um, with the success of this model, uh, we've now been funded by the VA and NIH to build a TBI version of this. So the Open Data Commons for TBI and uh, funded by the VA to build a private version of this for stem cell therapies in non-human primates. So this is a sort of closed version of the same ecosystem. Um, and then of course, as Dalton mentioned in the intro, I'm involved now in these, these large scale clinical discovery projects, Track TBI and Track SCI. So Track TBI now has over 3000 individuals with traumatic brain injury monitored on 6,000 clinical variables, and then high resolution MRI on a subset and GWAS on a subset. So it's highly multidimensional, also a very high number of individuals. Track SCI is a smaller effort, it's younger, and um, it focuses on the acute care phase of, of clinical traumatic spinal cord injury, starting at about uh, 20 minutes after the injury. Um, and it now has, I think about 250 subjects in our database, monitored on about 20,000 clinical variables, and now full transcriptomes on, on uh, immune cells. So I guess what I'm arguing here is we've sort of solved the problem of uh, kind of recasting uh, neurotrauma as a data problem. And all these efforts are really about this concept of fair data stewardship. And, and this is an acronym that stands for making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, and the FAIR data standards were actually published in 2016 in this paper in Scientific Data, and has since been endorsed by the NIH and actually is a critical piece of their 2023 data plan. So for those of us that are gonna have NIH grants in 2023, we're gonna be mandated to make our data FAIR. So there's this issue of how do we make the data itself kind of like a paper, something that you can access and search. Um, so the spinal cord injury field is actually kind of uniquely early in its adoption of FAIR data uh, principles. Lynn Jakeman um, put together a workshop in 2016, shortly after this paper came out. Um, Vance and John were there, I was there. Um, and basically it was about, uh, you know, getting the stakeholders in the field, including spinal cord injured individuals, um, you know, researchers, clinicians, and funders to discuss what would it take for us to make our data fair in spinal cord injury. And it was a relatively successful workshop. Um, it was reported in a paper that Vance is the last author on by Allison Callahan. The next year, we had a follow-up meeting where we said, okay, we, we took on board what you said about fair data principles, and we now have uh, this portal that we've built, this data system, and we need to discuss policies. You know, what are the conditions under which you would make your data available? And then the following year, we brought that data system to SFN and had a hackathon where we all sat in a room and tried to upload data and tried to break the system. So it was sort of a usability test. Um, and it was really fruitful because we were successful at breaking the system. Um, and now this thing uh, has really kind of evolved and take on a, taken on a life of its own. So um, the new uh, round of funding is from the Wings for Life Foundation, the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation, and uh, with sort of in-kind support uh, from ISRT, the International Spinal Research Trust. Kareem Fawad is the uh, contact PI. Um, I'm a multi-PI along with Jeff Greta and Marianne Martone who are prominent neuroinformaticians down in San Diego. So they're kind of the engineering team. In addition, we have a data science team lead, Abel Torres Espin, and John Gensel is, is uh, working on our community outreach board. And then we have this executive board that is comprised of uh, people at a variety of different career phases, some young investigators, then also a couple of prominent folks at Miami, uh, John Bixby and Vance Lemon. So this thing um, is now in its second year of funding and we've now built a system. We've reported out you know, our process to build the system in Journal of Neurotrauma. And this is what the portal looks like. So if you guys go to this website, you'll see this view. You can log in and then set up an account and then you can explore public data. You can upload your own data 
You can get DOIs for your data. So your data becomes citable. Um, so the concept of ODC SCI was um, based on that initial Bethesda meeting, uh, PIs were saying, you know, I just can't keep track of the data in my lab. I don't care about publishing the data. I just want to be able to go somewhere and pull down the data sets when I need them for a talk. So we set this thing up with different sort of uh, data spaces. There's the lab that is the primary home of the data. And that's totally under control of the PI. Only the PI and members of the PI's lab that they let in have access to the data. Um, we have sort of this, this common space that's sort of, uh, you can think of it like a preprint, you know, so you can put data into this common space if it's not ready for prime time, but you want sort of semi-public feedback. So all labs have access to this common space. And then of course, we have the ability to mint DOIs that make the data actually citable um, and, you know, that's public. So we've taken this model and now deployed it in the form of the Open Data Commons for TBI as well. And uh, now I just point out that on the front pages here, we have this, the, these are actual counters that get updated. So between the two, we now have, um, you know, like a hundred labs and over 10,000 subjects. I mean, the spinal cord injury has 8,000, you know, TBI has an additional, you know, um, three, two or 3,000 already. Um, and uh, we have a high number that have gone public so far. We have like 20 data sets that have been made public. And this is how that looks. So on the public landing page, there's, you know, this sort of abstract, and then there's a citation for the data. So this makes the data explicitly citable like a paper. And it's released on a Creative Commons by license, which actually means that legally, people can reuse this data. But when they do, they need to cite the authors in the same way that you reuse data when you're writing a paper. You say, you know, Dietrich et al. discovered this, and here I'm just kind of reusing this idea. Um, so, so I guess what I would say is that we have now successfully uh, taken, you know, the field of traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury preclinically and made them <laughs> real big data problems, you know. 10,000 animals on thousands of variables. So the question that people always ask is, so now you have big data, now what? What do you do? And um, I'm looking at Hannah here. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what they say is when you're fundraising, it's AI. When you're hiring, it's machine learning. And when you're implementing, it's regression. Um, so there's this cynical view out there that uh, machine learning and, and AI really are just kind of reframing statistics. You know, so there's this idea that you have this sort of craggy old system, you frame it up and call it machine learning. And then if you can brand it as artificial intelligence and deploy it on a large scale, then you have this large audience. So that's one view. Um, Others have argued, of course, machine learning and AI are not just glorified statistics. And this really kind of gets into semantics. I happen to be, you know, kind of an AI and machine learning practitioner, especially in some of my collaborations with the Department of Energy. Um, but I also am uh, the director of biostats for the UCSF Biomedical Sciences Graduate Program. So I view these things as very similar, you know, I, I will just say. Um, if you understand stats, I think you can learn to master machine learning. So the main difference, I think, is the scope of the outcome. So um, what we've been doing for our sort of data work products um, and our analytic work products is we view machine learning uh, as a tool for kind of understanding how the data are integrated in neurotrauma. So as a, as a simple use case, uh, consider grasping of a pellet after a traumatic brain injury or spinal cord injury or a stroke. Um, you know, you could come up with a really high fidelity, uh, you know, neurophysiological representation of this, or you could have a really stupid, you know, five point scale, like they can't open their hand, that's a zero. They can open their digits, that's a one. They can reach out, that's a two. Three, grab the food, four, put it to their mouth. Ultimately, we don't care as machine learning folks we just want to try to understand 
you know, function. And function can be manifested across these two different variables, these two different views of outcome. So ultimately, we're just trying to place this individual in the two variable space here between the neurophysiology representation and the grasping function representation. And we don't have a strong claim that we're gonna make that one of these representations is better than the other. We're just gonna look at the individual where they sit in this bivariate space. Ultimately, what we do care about is how this individual, whether they're a mouse, a rat, a pig, monkey, or human, stacks up against other individuals. So basically where this orange dot is relative to all others. And the same thing can be done across many different functional measures. So you get this multidimensional plane of function. And then you can do the same thing with the biomarkers and then tissue changes. And if you can track the same individual across these multidimensional outcomes, then you can draw linkages across the outcomes using the, the individual as the linking point. And you do this on a large scale, and then suddenly you can see how individuals cluster naturally in the multidimensional outcome space or disease space of neurotrauma. And then you can ask what makes this patient group different from that patient group, not on one outcome, but on all outcomes simultaneously. And then the question is, to what extent do these patient groups overlap? You know, do you see that there's a multidimensional intersection of these different patient groups, or are they totally separable? So this is a this is a tool for precision medicine. Then the same thing can be done for translation. So the individuals then are not patient groups, but individual species. And it can be used for reproducibility. So to look across different labs or different groups of animals. So um, I'm gonna close the, the sort of back half of my talk by focusing on each of those in turn, precision medicine, reproducibility, and then translation. Um, and I'm gonna start with reproducibility and preclinical traumatic brain injury. So this is work uh, that was undertaken by Jenny Halfley, who was a postdoc at the time in my team and is now assistant professor at UCSF and an executive in Roche. So she has this kind of dual career. Um, so she was really interested in understanding traumatic brain injury um, coming from a clinical perspective and an analytics perspective. And so um, I started a collaboration with her and then Ray Swanson and Steve Massa at the San Francisco VA. They had just closed a uh, program project grant in the VA where they had done uh, a large number of animals on many different outcomes and then looked at multimodal therapies to try to restore recovery um, or improve recovery after spinal cord injury, uh, sorry, after TBI. Um, so on each animal, they had 30 different outcome variables, a range of different behaviors, learning and memory, and then of course they had the histopath. And ultimately the question is what happened in these, in these studies? So you could do traditional dimension reduction where you flip the coin a bunch of times and try to find those outcomes that are laudatory to your hypothesis. You could say, oh, there's this difference between these two groups here and you know, maybe this interaction over here. But the real problem is that uh, with 30 different outcomes, you end up with potentially thousands of t-tests that you could do there or hundreds of ANOVAs. So um, Jenny, being Jenny, did them all. She just coded this up and ran every possible t-test in ANOVA. So that ended up being, you know, 6,000 t-tests or 340 ANOVAs or something like that with main effects and interactions. And she plotted the p-values for each of those statistical analyses. And that's what you have on the x-axis. So, you know, small p-values are over here, large are over here. And then on the y-axis, she plotted the number of tests that achieved that p-value. The first point I'd make here is that, um, you know, p-value of 0 0.05 was not particularly special. Um, it was just as probable in a meta-analytic way as a p-value of one. Um, in addition, if you only take these that are below 0 0.05, this comprises only about 16% of the possible findings. So another way to phrase this is that, you know, the total effect on average was 85% or 84% of the time not significant, which actually, you know, 
comes up really close to that 85% of the data that are in the file drawer. Um, so here we sort of have a microcosm of the biomedical literature in one study. Um, so rather than do that, what Ginny did is, uh, you know, after doing that, <laughs> she wanted to come up with a different way to look at outcome. And so she considered the, the multidimensional space of tissue sparing, general health, and functional behavioral measures all at once. And the goal of her analytics were to understand the VIN overlap in the variance explained across all of these. She used this tool known as nonlinear principal component analysis, which is uh, a type of unsupervised manifold learning, which is sort of some technical speak for saying, we're just trying to understand the disease space that is represented at this intersection. And uh, we call these you know, disease constructs, the principal components, and they're orthogonal. So PC1 is orthogonal to two and then three. And what she observed is that this first principal component accounted for about you know, 24% of the total variance in outcome. And it represented the intersection of Morris water maze, brain lesion, motor function, um, and both attentional and memory forms of the Morris water maze. So then she could take these individuals, calculate for each wrapped their unique position in this multidimensional space, project them into the disease manifold, and then look at whether there was an effective TBI. And lo and behold, there is a very large effective TBI in this multidimensional space of outcome. And then she could zoom in on the TBIs and say, I now know which way is up. You know, if a therapy has an effect, it should nudge animals toward this direction over here from right to left. And so she could then do, instead of 6,000 T-tests or, six, or 300 ANOVAs, she could do one ANOVA and ask, what is the effect in PC1? When she did this, she saw that there was a significant effect of this neurotrophic drug. In addition, there was uh, an effect of physical therapy, but the two effects combated each other and canceled each other out. So, um, in essence, there was sort of a limited set of neuroplasticity that you could target with either rehab or this neurotrophic drug. You put them together and the animals do worse, which is actually kind of a wild finding that was in the data, but you could not view it at a univariate level. So that was fun. It was a, you know, nature scientific reports paper. We were kind of proud of the methods. And to my great surprise, Nature Medicine picked up on this paper as an important example of how AI can be used in drug discovery. So it was featured in Nature News. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I guess to, to uh, interpret and perhaps overinterpret our results, um, this is the early evidence of how AI can be used in neurotrauma. So the idea here is you do an unsupervised pattern detector to extract the manifold. And then you ask, what is the effect of the drug in that multidimensional outcome space? So the next example comes from reproducibility and translation in spinal cord injury. So we applied the same kind of analytics across many different spinal cord injury um, devices. So, you know, the IH impactor, NYU impactor. And once we do this, we see that there's this very highly conserved multidimensional feature set that is essentially the motor function and its relationship to the degree of sparing. And I thought Dalton and Helen might like this. It's also inversely related to body temperature. So if lower body temperatures um, on the, on the uh, operating table, these animals tended to have higher outcome and you know, lower lesion sizes. So, um, and it turns out that this feature set, these few variables are so highly conserved that we can use it to compare across species. So we've actually done that comparing uh, rats to monkeys. And what we see is that in this PC1 feature set, there's no difference across species, but a very highly uh, significant or big impact of the injury itself. So if folks came to us and said, how does your machine learning help us understand translation? We would point to this set of variables. So I guess what I'd argue here is that we've taken a large amount of data and winnowed it down to a small number of features that are highly predictive of translation. And we did this in a way that was unbiased and algorithmic. Um, so 
Recently, we published a paper that sort of implements this in the open source programming language R. Um, and so there's a stats package now that's available and we've just published it last month in eLife. So I wanna close with uh, a couple of examples from clinical decision-making. So for that, I'm gonna turn my attention to Track SCI and Track TBI. So the Track SCI team is at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and involves every clinical service that sees spinal cord injured patients when they come to the hospital. And it's the only level one trauma center in San Francisco, so that's basically all the spinal cord injuries that come in. Um, and uh, it's kind of a unique group because we get them within on average 17.5 minutes of, of their initial EMS contact. San Francisco is pretty small and you know, everyone goes straight to the general. So um, we get them immediately. We have a code SCI that's activated and then we enroll these patients into our observational study. So Jason Talbot, a neuroradiologist in the team um, who also happens to have a PhD in white matter biology um, of spinal cord injury, partnered up with Jenny Halfley from my team to go after you know, what are the best MRI features early on in the recovery period or in the initial admission um, to predict outcome. And so they had multiple different radiological elements that they were examining. And, you know, Jenny applied the same manifold learning approach that she did in, in rats and was able to demonstrate that uh, the MRI feature space partitions into these two clusters, PC1 and PC2, that together were highly predictive of the AIS at discharge. And these images were taken, I should say, within the first four hours of the injury on average. So we have a three Tesla um, MRI scanner at, at the Zuckerberg. And so when these patients come in, they're rushed into the MRI and then into the operating theater. Um, so it's kind of interesting. We're starting to use these approaches and kind of advance them further. So Jason's team has now gone on to develop a deep learning neural network that can actually do automatic segmentation of the lesions um, from the radiological signals. Uh, so we can very quickly diagnose injuries and, um, and get them to the OR. So this sort of mirrors what's happened with track TBI. There's been a lot of innovation on the imaging side of traumatic brain injury. So Esther Yu is a neuroradiologist who also happens to have a PhD in physics, um, who was working with Jeff Manley, who's a neurosurgeon who happens to have a PhD in neuroscience. And um, uh, together they sort of advance this idea that early types of uh, MRI imaging can actually be a really useful biomarker for stratifying patients clinically. And they were able to achieve the first FDA approved biomarker for TBI. Um, and it's this T2 star weighted imaging sequence that they developed and reported in this paper. So this has actually been kind of an interesting romp um, in traumatic brain injury. You know, they, they, the track TBI project was formed in about 2013. And since then, you know, they've just generated a ton of high impact clinical papers that um, address all kinds of different aspects. My team has been involved in, in sort of biomarker discovery and then of course using these data to understand you know, uh, analytic approaches to improve our outcome prediction. Um, it's been pretty successful. I guess they have 75 um, papers and three FDA approvals so far. Uh, and now they're launching platform uh, clinical trials. So using all this information. So uh, Dalton, how am I doing with time? I was gonna close with one last little you, vignette. You're in great shape, Adam, just take your time. You're in good shape. Okay, good. So um, I guess, you know, all of this, what, I, what I've sort of described to this point in the talk is that we're thinking about neurotrauma as a big data problem. I stepped through examples of uh, how this is used for reproducibility and translation and clinical decision-making. Um, and it's all wonderful. It's been great for my career. <laughs> the problem, of course, is, um, is that when people sit down in their labs to do big data analytics, uh, they don't know where to begin, 
right? Um, it requires coding and it's quite difficult. So that problem I think can be summarized by this statement that and you know, advanced analytics are not for hobbyists. So there seems to be a need for cross-trained individuals who can do analytics, you know, machine learning and have the clinical and preclinical knowledge. And that ends up being a pretty short list of people currently. So one solution is to educate clinicians in analytics, but I have to say, I think that's the wrong way to go, um, frankly. The other is to try to get um, analysts to learn biomedicine, and that's an even worse way to go because you can become a programmer in two years, but then it takes 10 to become a biomedical scientist. And by the time you get there, the analytics you learned are outdated. So I think there's this real need to develop kind of user-friendly tools that do the advanced analytics and then empower the, the basic researchers and clinicians to use them. And that field is known as auto machine learning, auto ML. And um, I wanna talk a little bit about kind of one example of an adventure in auto ML that we've had. And this began uh, with a collaboration that I, um, over beers, I can tell you guys how this came about, but uh, it was random and very, you know, San Francisco-y. Um, but I ended up in this uh, collaboration with this guy, Gunnar Carlson, who um, was the chair of, of math at Stanford at the time, but was in the process of spinning out his lab to develop these auto ML tools that are built around this idea of mathematical topology. The idea is that, you know, there's the advanced abstract mathematical shapes that you can come up with really rigorous definitions of mathematically. And he sort of had this uh, insight at the end of his academic career that you know, databases are in essence, multi-dimensional abstract objects that you need a mathematical description of. So he developed this tool that allows you to basically do everything I've discussed today. So you can grab data that's in a database, push it into a multi-dimensional space, you know, a metric space of correlations, for example, and then you can apply a mathematical lens and it will project individuals into this a multi-dimensional manifold that has been described by your metric and your lens. And then on top of that, you can recluster these individuals based on different sized clusters that overlap partially. And what evolves from this is this view of similarity, a similarity map where individuals that are um, indistinguishable are in nodes. And when there are two groups that overlap with some individuals that forms an edge or a line. You deploy this on a large scale and you end up with this sort of topological two-dimensional representation of the multi-dimensional space of outcome. Oh, that's a lot of words, sorry. Um, so in essence, this was a kind of user-friendly tool for doing really advanced analytics. And a postdoc in my team, Jessica Nielsen, took this for a run. Um, and is, she's now, by the way, an assistant professor in University of Minnesota. And the, the target here was preclinical spinal cord injury and preclinical traumatic brain injury. So um, it's a pretty meaty paper in nature communications. I'm gonna just focus on one aspect of this paper. And it focuses on spinal cord injury and this uh, multi-center spinal cord injury study that was done in the early nineties by Wise Young and a bunch of other folks. Um, so this was a multi-center blinded randomized study of, of um, neuroprotective therapeutics in rats. So um, they had you know eight different centers and they developed these rigorous protocols and they ran all these animals, like thousands of animals. And in the end, they didn't really find whiz bang effects. And so um, without having anything to report, it doesn't actually show up in the literature except in two forms. One is this uh, Basso Beatty Bresnahan locomotor outcome scale that people have probably heard of that was basically developed and then deployed in Mascus. And then the NYU impact device, which was developed as part of Mascus. So, so the real legacies that we have in the literature are an outcome scale and an injury device. But the findings themselves and the data are locked up in these paper records here. So. Jessica um, deployed a couple of really uh, dedicated young people to turn all this paper into data and uh, had some success. So she uh, 
developed a cohort of about 334 animals with thoracic spinal cord injury from mascus. And then she deployed this topological data analysis on the data. So 334 animals, hundreds of variables simultaneously. And what emerged was this very simple topological map. And um, I've colored it here by the BBB scale. So a higher score is more red and a lower score is more blue. And the first thing that she noticed is that there are these groups here that actually had quite different outcomes. And when she looked at their injury impact parameters, they were identical, they were indistinguishable. So um, then she asked, why are these groups different? And I should say at this point, you know, we're using auto ML, we're asking the machine learning to tell us what distinguishes these groups. And, you know, I had my own hypothesis and I was convinced that we had saved mascus, that we had discovered a drug therapy, um, which actually illustrates the problem with scientific bias because I was dead wrong. There was no effect of these therapeutics. However, there was a really persistent big effect of this animal care variable, which was the blood pressure on the table at the time of the injury. And it turns out that animals that had high blood pressure, hypertension, actually had very low outcome. So high blood pressure was seeming to be very predictive of poor locomotor recovery over time. And um, that was kind of a shocking finding because when we talk to our clinical colleagues, they say, we don't have any guidelines for the upper boundary of blood pressure in the OR in spinal cord injury. We try to avoid low blood pressure, but we don't keep an eye on high blood pressure. So this suggested, in fact, that there might be a need to look at this clinically. In addition, it seemed like there was a need to understand whether this thing is reproducible before we try to change clinical practice. So Jessica and I went and got a Wings for Life grant to go back and get all the rest of the mascus data. So this was 334 animals. Um, and we were surprisingly funded to do this. So we went to Wise Young's uh, storage unit. So the way this project worked is they did it at NYU then Wise Young moved to Rutgers, New Jersey, and all of the NYU neurosurgical data went into this storage unit and it was closed for 20 years. So Jessica and I went and got it. Um, we recovered a bunch of old formats and then had to figure out how to deal with that, a bunch of paper that we then scanned. And uh, that recovery process was partially successful. We have a paper that came out two weeks ago now um, describing how we're able to excavate an additional 1,100 animals. So we now have about 1,500 mascus animals that have been recovered um, in their data sets. And this allowed us to then deploy actual hypothesis testing on a large scale where we could look at what is the effect of center and blood pressure on outcome. And the short story is that we replicated Jessica's original finding and we were able to show that this effect was sustained irrespective of center. So we can control for center. And it turns out that blood pressure has this Goldilocks zone, too high or too low, and the animals start to deteriorate in their outcome prediction. So that was fun. I mean, it was gratifying to be right about something for once. Um, but uh, even more importantly, we we're able to take all these data from Mascus and give it new life. So we've, uh, uploaded the data to the Open Data Commons for Spinal Cord Injury, and we've released these as public data sets. First, there's Jessica's, which actually had been reported in a number of kind of prominent papers in the field, and then the rest of Mascus, which is an additional 1,100. So we have these two DOIs that are out there now. And uh, I guess this is sort of the, the fun kind of end to the talk. Um, through this like random walk discovery and our need to do machine learning, we've been able to find methods to, you know, um, make dark data uh, available and fair again. So with that, I'll just plug the places where I work. Um, I'm at the UCSF Weill Institute Brain and Spinal Injury Center, which is at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. It was a really great name three years ago, less cool now. Um, and I also am a, a, a VA investigator and I have a lab out at the San Francisco VA. And most importantly, there's not a single thing I did today in this talk that I actually did. You know, So um, 
everyone in my lab is just totally brilliant. It's a great group. And we've been very lucky with funding and we've been lucky with collaborators who are willing to just feed us all their data when they're done with it. So um, we're finding data reuse to be a fruitful thing. I'll stop there. Okay, Adam, thank you so, so very much. What a fantastic presentation and just so many things that we've learned going back to data and, and really doing a deep dive in some of the techniques that you've, uh, you've uh, um, you know, I, I didn't know how to spell machine learning until, you know, more recently where I'm thinking about, you know, how important it is to utilize these and this holistic approach that you talked about so well and the, um, the what you've learned from it. I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, I grew up, um, you know, doing uh, stroke research. So it was all about physiology. It was all about physiology. And it was about blood pressure. It was about temperature. It was a PO2, PCO2, and things like that. So we, it's great to see that a physiological variable such as blood pressure in this case has such a dramatic effect. And that's really fantastic. And, and that's just to learn from, our, uh, you know, our, to our scientists and our students that, you know, physiology, and we don't monitor that so much anymore. In fact, in the brain uh, operation, brain trauma therapy, we were the only group that was measuring physiology. And we saw that some of the drugs that we gave affected physiology adversely sometimes in those types of effects. And we know that from the clinical arena. So anyway, uh, I'll open it up for questions now. I've got a lot of questions, but I think Jim has got a question. Jim, go ahead, unmute yourself. Hey, Adam, thanks a lot for giving this presentation today. I really enjoyed it. I have a comment and then I have a question. So when you think about the blood pressure in rats that are undergoing spinal cord injury surgery, I remember back when I was a graduate student that some of these experiments were being done, you know, your, your use, the blood pressure seems to account for some of the outcome, but when you handle those animals before surgery, they can be very stressed or they can not be very stressed. And so it brings up the question as to whether that linkage to blood pressure itself is the mechanism or whether it points at another mechanism. And the other thing I just wanted to ask you is that you present powerful methods to establish linkages, but to what extent do these uh, give us the mechanisms? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, those are really good questions, Jim, thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I don't mean to imply a causal relationship here necessarily. I mean, the truth is to, to understand the, the causal flow between the blood pressure and the outcome, there, there are methods to do that to some extent, you, you know, in a regression format. There's a researcher, Judea Pearl, who had a career about this, you know, in economics. You don't ever have the ability to intervene in economic predictors, but you can still forecast. Um, and in essence, posit causation as a statistical tool rather than an actual interventional tool. So um, to do that study requires that you somehow clamp blood pressure at these different levels and you know, then do a spinal cord injury. And we've actually done that study. Well, we, Jonathan Pan at UCSF, who's an anesthesiologist has done that study and we're working on writing up the results. Um, so uh, it has to be done sort of indirectly because as you know, we have vasopressors and then we have certain anesthetics that suppress blood pressure. So it's, it's you know, the extent to which you can really do the clamping is the difficulty, um, but you're exactly right. I mean, one way to think about all these machine learning tools is that they are the fanciest form of observation. You know, it's the first step of the scientific process. You gotta observe, detect the pattern, then form a hypothesis. I think the problem is that in neurotrauma, we're trying to observe multidimensionally. And so, you know, a lot of our hypothesis uh, testing has been so targeted that we don't actually understand the outcome that we're supposed to be measuring, you know. Um, does that make sense? Thank you very much. Other questions? I think when I was talking to Jeff Manley uh, several weeks ago, and he was telling me about cleaning cleaning the data up so he could actually, you know, put it into the big the big uh, machine and, and and look at it, uh, utilizing the approaches. Um, so if if for, we do a lot of spinal cord injury and TBI in the Mind Project, obviously, and I think we really need to to step up the plate in terms of providing uh, some of our data. 
Uh, is there a format in terms of being able to upload data? Is, is that a, a problematic issue uh, for scientists? Uh, the, the, the answer is it's problematic, but I think it's problematic because of um, education. So um, in the open data commons, we're trying to impose a very minimal, even more minimal than Vance and John's minimal information standards for spinal cord injury. Uh, basically, the, the format is you have the variables in a single row at the top of a comma separated value file. And then you have an identifier for the individual animal. Beyond that, we have no constraint. So it's tabular data in a giant square or rectangle. Um, and the, the issue that Jeff was referring to is how do you take a seven Tesla connectome and put it in that format? <laughs> and that is a non-trivial process you know, to ingest um, the numbers uh, when you have you know, millions of numbers uh, can be quite difficult. But the, the data systems we're working with in the California um, Institute for Technology, Cal IT, can handle this stuff as long as you put it in this you know, giant CSV file. Good. Vance, you're unmuted. Did you have a question or comment? I have a question. So we're slowly putting mouse data into the uh, ODC SCI and we, you know, there are animals from different experiments, you know, slightly different injuries, blah, 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 and, um, different outcome measures. Um, will we be able to like compare that data to other people who've been doing mouse experiments and look at the manifold and see where our various treatments fall in, in that space? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, we can, uh, you have variables and the question then can be formulated as a, as a manifold learning question. You say, I'm going to project all these animals into this manifold, and then I'm going to look at the loadings of individual variables. And if I have two variables that have different names that are correlated 0.99, I can ask myself, are those the same variable? And that can sort of trigger a conversation about semantics, I think. Does that make sense? And uh, Austin Chow and Abel Torres Espin are, are you know, now indoctrinated <laughs> and, uh, and are capable of helping, helping you guys do that. Great. Hannah, do you have a comment? I see you're, you're live now. Hi, um, thank you, Dr. Ferguson. It was a great talk and a great introduction to what I have to talk about in a little bit. So uh, good pre preparation for me, but no, I just wanted um, to ask quickly, kind of broad scope, how you see auto ML really implementing itself into the neurotrauma field? Is this something that any lab is really gonna be able to jump in with or is it still going to require, you know, quite a bit of work on terms of standardization and reproducibility and that kind of work? I mean, to, to think that we'll be able to sidestep these issues completely with auto ML is I think, um, incorrect, you know, so, and, but um, I think that uh, with the more advanced forms of auto ML that are starting to be commercialized, it may be possible to do this pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, the, the relationship with Gunnar Carlson was one form, but now there are a bunch of these companies that are doing types of supervised auto ML that are really quite advanced. And they'll do things like run every single publicly available algorithm all at once in a giant instance of Amazon uh, web services. So, so the tools are getting quite powerful and their AI um, decision points that are superimposed on that where the AI tool will say, here is the very best model, I believe. And then you can interrogate that further. Other questions? Oh, John? Yeah, uh, thanks Adam, that was great. Um, so I, I'm slightly less optimistic about the ability of the ODCSCI to garner data from a whole bunch of different labs um, because I know how painful it is for us and, and we're supposed to be somehow on the forefront. But let's say that that happens. <laughs> it strikes me that, that one service that you or the, the ODC could do would be uh, to run these kinds of uh, <laughs> queries and 
demonstrate what kinds of outcome measures are so highly correlated that it's somehow silly to measure more than one of them and then provide the community with, okay, here are three clusters of outcome measures that you can do that are measuring orthogonal things that then will provide you with much more information. Is that, is that something that you envision? Yes, I, I think that's possible um, for sure. You know, we've been uh, at UCSF deploying that way of thinking for a few years in the RAT studies. So people don't collect all the variables. They collect a subset that the PCs suggest they should collect. And that's worked out reasonably well so far. On the issue of the usability, as you know, this is an, this is an evolving uh, area and the grant is, is currently funded to try to, to improve this. Um, I think the, the big hang up is likely people wanting to um, have all their data across their lab adhere to standards. And my understanding with you guys is given your background in sort of rigorous standards, um, you're not willing to just throw up slop, you know, but there are labs that are willing to throw up slop. And, you know, um, as you know, my, my colleague, Marianne Martone likes to call me, uh, you know, she said there are the semantic idealist and then there are the uh, data-driven nihilists um, in the world of data science. And I tend to be on the nihilistic end of the spectrum. I tend to think if you give me the data, then at least we'll have something, you know. Um, yeah, I don't disagree, but, but, but you're right about us also. Okay, it's, it's noon. Is there any other burning questions that we can uh, ask Adam while he's here? I, I must just say that I was long, long time ago when um, NIH was giving millions and millions and millions of dollars to Jeff Manley, I was a little concerned <laughs> that those, those dollars are going away from R01s and things of this nature. Uh, but uh, I think I've seen the light. I think, um, you know, in terms of what, what, the, what, what the publications are showing us, us now, um, in terms of very rigorous science, I think we're learning quite a lot. So I'm certainly on board. So Adam, thank you again so much for outstanding presentation and, and being here for Hannah and all of us uh, today. And um, we'll give you a, a, a little time off and we'll see you soon, okay? Sounds good. I'll, I'll see you guys in about an hour, I think. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.